But then, the majority of our countries here did not exist. We exist now. The difference is we want to exist a hundred years from now. And if our existence is to mean anything, then we must act in the interests of all of our people who are dependent on us. And if we don't, we will allow the path of greed and selfishness to sow the seeds of our common destruction. The leaders of today, not 2030, not 2050, must make this choice. It is in our hands. And our people and our planet need it more than ever. We can work with who is ready to go because the train is ready to leave. And those who are not yet ready, we need to continue to ring circle and to remind them that their people, not our people, but their citizens need them to get on board as soon as possible. Code red, code red to the G7 countries. Code red, code red to the G20. Earth to cop, that's what it said. Earth to cop. For those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have a heart to feel, 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda, for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we've come here today to say, try harder, try harder, because our people, the climate army, the world, the planet, needs our actions now, not next year, not in the next decade. Thank you. Hello, everyone, left reckoners. There's Sleepy Joe. The bottom corner there. And, you know, Sleepy Joe, myself as a Catholic growing up, I've been there in masks, you know, trying to get stay away. But I wasn't asleep. Uh, that was Mia Motley there. Uh, hello, Dave. Hey, man, how's it going? Uh, it's going, you know. <laughs> I think the indicators are mixed, but uh, as for mm-hmm. me personally, uh, I'm happy to be here. So I'm happy to be here too. I mean, I'm very, very happy after the, the positive result here in Austin um, in our local elections. We'll be talking about that a little bit later um, in the show. I know it wasn't the case for everybody all across the country, though, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Nothing. I mean, yeah, I, I think the thing is, is I think it was Noah Cohen had a tweet is like, you know, you can't be too invested in this sort of stuff because we don't actually live in a, a genuine democracy and mm-hmm. it's going to be an auto battle generally but i think we'll focus a little bit more on the uh v- very little on mccall we'll say some stuff uh meta analysis of it i think gen- uh, uh, maybe but um there's some good news in certain places mm-hmm. um, m- much more good news than say at cop uh 26 <laughs> yeah um, which i mean is like um Unless, oh, I'm mean, actually, Matt, could you why don't you tease our uh, our interview too before we get into the the COP twenty six? Yes. So, um, specifically on the Minneapolis elections, we talk with GP Jacob at GP Jacob four, uh, the host of the Money Power Land Solidarity Podcast, uh, which I would say go listen to the pre all this like sort of like the chatter about. Mm-hmm. Should you participate in elections or are they icky or or are they going to lead us to the promised land? See, like, how you actually deal with it, I think, in the pre- last two episodes of the Money Parliament Solidarity podcast, where, you know, it has limitations of it. But, I mean, the good news, I'll just tease now, is Robin Wansley Warlabaugh, who ran as an independent socialist, not, not seeking any sort of Democratic farm labor um, party d- 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 Democrat endorsement. She won in Ward 2 by, like, mm. double-digit votes. So every vote does count. It's great to have an independent socialist on there. And I think some other DSA dual ticket uh, people won as well which is also good um mm. so uh but yeah uh, money power land solidarity folks go give them some love uh, because 
he was uh, um, working with Robin's campaign um, particularly. So uh, you, you love to see it. As they say, yeah, and that's an extremely like that's, those were positive results. I mean, there are also positive results in uh, Massachusetts, North Carolina, um, and Florida, and might be good to spend some time getting into those in the future. Um, but before we get into our interview about um, human caging in the American police state, we got to start uh, with with COP twenty six. And I know um, for folks who are watching the majority report, they had um, our friends on um, from uh, La Ruta del Clima uh, talking about sort of the feelings um, that people were having and the kind of early analysis. Um, so we won't like go over everything that's been happening, but I just wanted to note, you know, a, a couple of things up top. Um, one, as you saw earlier, you know, we have Sleepy Joe there who is very happy to sort of bask in the limelight. Um, Though he's not too interested in what's actually being said there when he is off camera. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing so far is a lot of pledges, which is pretty much what these massive climate change uh, <laughs> meetings have led to. It's a lot of pledges, right, without any kind of actionable um you know, mechanisms to make sure that there's compliance with these pledges. I mean, the fact is, is as we've mentioned, when we had Sam Good, uh, Sam Goodman and Adrian on the show, um, we were talking about the fact that, you know, Celebrating the fact that they've done this 26 times is not a positive thing. It shows that very, very, very little, unfortunately, gets done. And the big talk so far has been about these methane uh, plans. I don't know how familiar you are with them, Matt, but basically, um, you know, the the pledges that we've got from around 20 countries um, is that these countries will reduce their methane emissions by 30 percent um, of the 2020 value by 2030. And again, as we've seen from Paris to Copenhagen, a lot of times these pledges might seem very massive going into it, uh, but when it comes time to sort of look at how serious these countries were at enforcing it domestically, um, you know, there's a very, very different picture, um, which I think is, is, is notable, especially since, you know, Joe Biden has tried to take such a lead here um, in, in this, uh, you know, th this conference so far. Yeah, I mean, it's. A, I remember he would just say things in the campaign a lot, like "I'm the most environmental guy out there. I'll do the most." <laughs> and it's like, no. I mean, ultimately, he's going there and complaining about gas prices and falling asleep. Um, you want to say something about that? No, I mean, I wanted to. I wanted to highlight again for folks who are maybe watching this later, somebody who did show uh, much more courage and, and tenacity um, during th this meeting, uh, which was who was uh, Mia Motley, who's the Prime Minister of Barbados, um, a nation that is very, very threatened, certainly as we all are, um, by climate change, but is in this very, very difficult position of not being. Uh, one of the most powerful nations there, one of the nations that has the most um, resources at their disposal to one, just cut, you know, cut things back to be able to sort of uh, reduce emissions. Um, but she certainly has the courage of, of somebody who wants to fight for a better world. And I know she was, so, Michael was somebody who was uh, very impressed by her um, for a long time. So I just want to share a little bit from her talk, uh, her mm -hmm. speech, because I think it, it really does highlight the, the severity of the moment. The leaders of today, not 2030, not 2050, must make this choice. It is in our hands. And our people and our planet need it more than ever. We can work with who is ready to go because the train is ready to leave. And those who are not yet ready, we need to continue to ring circle and to remind them that their people, not our people, but their citizens need them to get on board as soon as possible. Code red, code red to the G7 countries. Code red, code red to the G20. Earth to cop, that's what it said. Earth to cop. For those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have a heart to feel, 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda, for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we've come here today to say, try harder, try harder. Because our people, the climate army, 
the world, the planet, needs our actions now, not next year, not in the next decade. Thank you. And, and she's certainly correct there. And um, unfortunately, what we've been seeing from the Biden administration, who is probably one of the most you know Im important people listening to that speech right there, and just you know to note that Sleepy Joe happened earlier in the conference, not directly at that speech, but no less despicable because in the, the speech where Joe Biden was dozing off, it was a youth climate activist talking about their needs for the future. Um, so it's no more despicable that Joe Biden had no time or attention for them. Um, yeah, but I, I wanted to, to note that, like, this is one of those moments where just moving past the kind of, uh, you know, so obviously so much of the discourse around climate change in this country is about pushing back against the climate change deniers. Right. The GOP. But I'm sorry, these kind this kind of dedication to these failed policies, to these failed systems that we're seeing the vast majority of modern day liberals um, attach themselves to. And most certainly Joe Biden is just as much of a climate denial. Um, you know, the, the fact is, is that the, the plan that they've put forward um, to deal with climate change in the United States is nowhere near adequate. And I, I noted this yesterday um, during. During, during my stream, but I want to note it again, um, that it's very much connected uh, to this very this old failed neoliberal um, free market mechanism for how we're going to deal with climate change. So this is from Matt Huber, who again has a um, book coming out, uh, which I'm very excited to read, Climate Change is Class War, uh, coming out in May 2022. Um, mm -hmm. He notes here that out of the Build Back Better bill, um, around 86% of all investments in the energy sector are tax credits, $320 billion, meaning we still have to just hope the private sector achieves the necessary decarbonization. Sunrise Movement made the CCC, the, the Climate Conservation Corps, the center of their demands. It gets only 30 billion dollars or nine percent of the tax credits right this is inadequate um this is denial um and the belief that the same kind of system that got us into this mess in the first place is going to be what gets us out is absolutely delusional i noted um so i saw earlier today kate um, aronoff who's been at cop 26 noted that i think it was bp british uh, petroleum. Uh, one of their uh, executives um, was using the terminology of the just transition <laughs> to talk about uh, oil company profits in the near future. Um, so we are already um, in a dire moment where, look, these our opponents are sort of getting well versed in saying we care about climate change, we care about all these kind of things. Um, and we're even seeing some action from governments, but it still is tied to this market logic, which got us into this place, uh, this mess in the first place. Um, and that system is very, very easy to exploit. I just wanted to note um, really quick on coal, um, something that you know Biden, you know, has been a. <laughs> Fair, uh, you know, a pretty um, strong booster, of, frankly, throughout his political life. Um, right. This is in this plan, again, that we're fighting to make sure it even gets f through in its current state, right? Like, there's a fight to make sure that even these kind of inadequate proposals get through in their current state. Uh, but note this, this is in Bloomberg today. Uh, Biden's uh, carbon capture plans holds lifeline to coal plants. Uh, Coal-fired uh, power plants would be eligible for billions of dollars in extra tax breaks under President Joe Biden's economic legislation if they install carbon capture systems, an incentive that environmental groups say may delay the retirement of dozens of facilities. Uh, power plants that capture their carbon dioxide emissions would be eligible for a tax credit of as much as $85 per metric ton under the draft of Biden's $1.75 trillion spending plan released by the House last week. That's an increase from a rate of $50 a metric ton in current law. The change could result in a single 1,000 megawatt coal plant receiving six billion dollars in payments over 12 years, according to analysis of the proposed credit by the environmental group Sierra Club, which estimates the increase uh, could result in a quarter of the nation's coal fleet delaying retirement. You bake the shit in, 
um, to this kind of, you know, these, these, this market incentive plan, right, for how we're going to deal with climate change. And you leave the door open for the same systems, for the same people and the same organizations that have driven us into this, this moment of crisis. Um, you're giving them uh, an opportunity to continue, one, polluting the planet on the taxpayer's dime. I mean, this is the kind of big brain shit that we're getting from these people, right? So I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate to sound cynical, but I don't really believe what I'm seeing or hearing uh, coming out of these international conferences about how serious the United States is about dealing with climate change um, today. Yeah, I mean, carbon capture would be cool if it had been proved at scale to actually do anything, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to that. But, like, they talk about it as if a giant breakthrough has been made. And no, it's this is still just a, basically a waste of money and a way for coal companies to extend their lives longer right <laughs> like and that's frankly frankly what a lot of unfortunately you know, people call it greenwashing like a lot of um the people who are in the room and making decisions um, are people who are trying to find nice little golden parachutes for these same industries to continue um i don't know before we go to one of the greatest thinkers of of our time um and their sort of pushback against the climate science um I, I don't know do you have anything else that you want to know before we move on uh no no not really i just say i one thing i think that's just interesting is you know because i'm keyed into it because of our talk with sam and adrian mm -hmm. uh with the the of you know even ben shapiro is talking about okay we need to adapt and mitigate a little bit right um but that that he's saying we need to do that and then the next breath saying but these people are asking for money it's interesting to know like which way those things are shifting right because i think yeah. ben is ben's like top guy on facebook he has some sort of coordination with reactionary politics and globally right so uh, that's i think that's interesting that Hopefully, that's a good sign that they're getting a little bit anxious that maybe some of the right sorts of questions are are starting to bubble up a little bit. But I mean, yeah. it is, it's not super apparent at the uh, at the uh, uh, sort of heights at, at this moment. I mean, it's, for me, what I see is m more, you know, of a. I don't know, trying to signal that they, they get it and they see it. Um, yeah. But not a lot of. Because I'm sorry, at the end of the day, these are extremely powerful companies that make a lot of money and there's a shitload of money invested in the in, in the continuation of us uh, drilling for more oil something that biden has encouraged uh, countries abroad to do this week um there's so much money that's invested into these systems and when you have money invested in these systems i mean this is capitalism 101 right you want to have a return on your investment and until we start to deal with that engine and that mechanism we're not going to get very very far um, and that's and that's that's why it's just sort of, um, you know, this is obviously a very alarming moment that what, what what we're seeing. But I just think it should make it very very crystal clear. If you're still on the fence, you know, thinking that we're just going to be able to reform our way out of this, you know, if we can just sort of like do some tweaks on capitalism, the climate crisis really uh, sort of blows up that entire debate um, because there is not a mechanism um, in the system. Um, that that will allow us to decarbonize without radically reducing the profits of the, these companies that are at the very top of this uh, of, of this society and the system that we're living under uh, and we need to start having the confidence and the courage to start coming at them directly and pushing for political um solutions uh, to it because this kind of idea that we're going to get market fixes and we can all sort of come together and sit at the you know the grand table of humanity uh, <laughs> and solve this i think it's becoming very clear that's not going to be the case yeah, and it's interesting just like in what's the big science related uh, social movement that sort of lived on in the internet was that whole I fucking love science, right? Mm -hmm. And it really is gearing people up to like be like when they say science, it means like the new products from Apple and mm -hmm. shit like that, right? Like it, it very much became this sort of fetishization of capitalist innovation and it sucks it's it's the exact same shit the way that they were um worshiping the like sort of lords of industry a hundred years ago right like mm -hmm. just a complete perversion of how shit gets done just because they managed to um 
I guess, monopolize all of it. But. Hell, I mean, you know, we're seeing uh, everyone's favorite boy, Bill Gates, showing up again at this conference. You know, somebody who's, who's very much, you know, been a, a leader in the um, refusal to move and to do serious action on this. It's some, for some reason still being He's included. Busy. In, well, being included in these conversations of like global weight and like you know like incredible importance for human history um yeah let's get the jackass from washington state um, yeah. to come here and tell us what he wants us to do he's it's, gonna I go mean, from uh education in america to uh birth rates in africa to, to farming. The pandemic to farming i mean take a fucking vacation bill like relax a little bit buddy and Bill, I, I would have a little bit more respect for Bill if he took the the Jordan Peterson round. I just have to share this because it's so good, Matt. I know some people <laughs> might have seen this, but Jordan Peterson, um, you know, has come out of retirement or hiding, um, yes. and is now back to one of the most man. important uh, questions of our time. Um, which I don't know, Matt. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you might be able to read this better than me. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it says, uh, "Let the climate change modelers model the future price of a single stock." For five years, for one year, but the entire climate was okay. Sorry, but the entire climate is everything for eighty years. So it's it's. I mean, it's too much. I I don't know how people still respect this guy's an intellect, but beyond it, I mean, the the argument here he's making is is obviously clearly absurd. Um, to act like these things are well, it's also mathematically way. illiterate to the extent that I understand. It's it's easier to model these things on longer uh, time scales than shorter. But yeah. well, also I'm sorry. Like the difference between climate and the stock market is like the stock market essentially being a barometer of investor confidence, right? And the success of like the American system of, of finance, right? Much less so uh, what climate is, right? Which is actual moving things in the physical world and physical reality around us, right? I mean, it's just. <laughs> it's absurd and i don't want to bore everybody with it but it is very fun if you go and find that tweet there are some bitcoiners who are trying to like go um jordan peterson into coming in and sort of saying that he thinks bitcoin will be necessary to uh fight climate it's, change <laughs> it's called stake coin and you get a stake coin every time you order a steak at a new uh, michaela peterson branded uh steak <laughs> restaurant <laughs> But they don't realize that Jordan Peterson um, doesn't believe that climate change is a real thing. So you can't really get him to say that Bitcoin's be a solution to that if his whole thesis is denying climate change. I don't know. Um, I just think this is a good example of, uh, I don't know, the fact that there are a lot of charlatans out there. Despite the fact that we might see think that the right wing is moving. I mean, there is still a very, very powerful movement trying to uh, continue to deny and delay and to, to run interference for these companies. Did you see what Daddy Elon said about? He was asked like what uh, what crypto he owns. He's like Doge, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, I think. And he's like, but I've always said, don't bet the farm on crypto. It uh, creating money isn't created in currency. It's by making actual products. I so did basically see that. just saying like, yeah, you're not. We're, this isn't creating value. And <laughs> I just say like, when when he's right, he's right. So. We'll be going, uh, don't worry, everybody. We have not lost our soul later in the show. And I think in the post game too, we're going to show a couple examples about how Elon Musk was very, very, very wrong, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't know. Find find ways um, to get involved in this fight that aren't sort of pining our hopes on international climate conferences and certainly not um, the forward vision of people like Joe, My Joe Biden and Joe Manchin. Yeah, unless you can like massively disrupt those climate conferences um <laughs> anyways uh yeah so uh we had a great talk now i think we can uh, mm -hmm. first of all patreon.com slash left reckoning we uh we put the um discussion with jacob of money parlance solidarity up on youtube for everyone to uh, watch it early um it was typically our uh, our, our would have been our, our patron only show so thanks our patrons um we're gonna have a think tank i think uh coming up uh this weekend mm -hmm. um so patreon.com slash uh, left reckoning for that um and coming up here we have uh, alec Herakotsanis, uh at equality alec on twitter uh very smart guy um he wrote a, the book uh, uh, Usual Cruelty, the Complicity of Lawyers in the American Justice System. Uh, that's going to be about 37 minutes. I'll come back and uh, reflect on elections a little bit. Uh, so we'll see you in a little bit.
Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, as always, David Griscom. How's it going, y'all? It's good. And joining us this uh, Wednesday is Alec Karakatsanis. He is the founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps and author of uh, author of Usual Cruelty, The Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Justice System. Alec, thank you so much for making time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I wanted to have you on to sort of like set a baseline for what we're dealing with. We've been talking about uh, sort of defund struggles in Austin and Minneapolis particularly, but I wanted to sort of like give people an overview in case they haven't really put it seen put it in the stark terms that you put it in for instance what sort of the carceral state of america is you have a a a stat you put out on twitter that america uh, jails black people at six times the rate of apartheid south africa um give us a little bit which i thought was just mind-blowing um how else should we understand the basically the country we're living in right now it's really unprecedented. The rate of human caging in this country's modern contemporary society is, is something we've not seen anywhere in, in the recorded histories of the modern world. So we are caging human beings at a rate about five times the steady historical average that we saw from about 1790 to 1965, 1970. And then since then it's skyrocketed to about 500% of what the steady historical average was in this country. We are caging people about five to 10 times the rate of other comparably wealthy countries around the world. Um, We are, as you mentioned, caging black people at rates that are unprecedented, six times the rate of people at South Africa at the height of apartheid. Um, So it's not a random distribution of people that we're caging. Um, The vast majority, depending on on how you estimate, about 90% of all the people that are being put in cages that are separated from their families and schools and jobs and churches and loved ones and and communities and, and people that, that can't hug their children, um, about 90% of them are poor. And so the, the, when the criminal punishment bureaucrats call themselves you know, law enforcement officials, which is something that police and prosecutors like to call themselves, it's very critical that we understand they are only enforcing some laws against some people some of the time. And it's also the same group of people that decide things like what should be legal and what should be illegal. All of these decisions are made based on what helps people who own things. And that's a really important thing to understand about our criminal system. It's it's really um, a way for people who own things to control the rest of people in society and to to punish people throughout history um, who are engaging in activities that that are threatening to, to people who own things. Yeah. So let's just talk about property a little bit more, you know, like the South Africa example, that would seem that what what's so striking to me about that is like they clearly have the race apartheid element of why you would want a carceral state is is the six times. Is that just because of it, like what's your understanding of how we got to be that much worse than apartheid South Africa? Well, we just have much higher rates of policing and human caging than than contemporary South Africa. So we're also caging non-black people at at much higher rates than South Africa was at the time of apartheid. Um, So I think um, this current version of of American society is the most punitive and the most harsh, the most senselessly violent in terms of of how we respond to social problems like homelessness, like mental health um, uh, problems, like poverty. Um, We respond to those those social creations, those, those problems that are really problems of public health and social policy we respond to them with guns, tasers, um, military weaponry, surveillance, and and cages, and and that's really unprecedented in in the recorded history of the modern world. It's 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 always a trip for me, and then I'll let you get in, David. But just like the way I grew up. Um, you know, very curious guy. I started reading the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, like wanting to get an understanding of this. And then you realize like the country you live in should be writing these sorts of same sorts of things. Like I, I, like that sort of the way we, I guess it's American exceptionalism, right? We believe we're free as we're the uh, giant cager. Um, David, you could jump in if you want to. Oh, I mean, I just, I just want to note, um, you know, the, the role that both like poverty and like underfunding of state and local governments like plays into this. I just want to pull up this um, report from the, uh, from the New York times 
just about cities across the country um, that receive significant amounts of their city revenue from fines and fees, right? Um, and as, as you note in your work, like, you know, w- when you're coming at people for things like broken taillights, et cetera, um, and you don't have the ability to pay, I mean, it throws you right into the middle of this carceral and abusive state. I think a really important thing to understand about that is something I learned, particularly when I was in Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown, um, the vast bulk of what police do has nothing to do, no even arguable connection with, with what they call public safety. Mm-hmm. So the New York Times did a really uh, impressive investigation last summer that showed that only 4% of all police time in this country, all time spent by all police officers, only 4% of it Um, was spent on what police themselves called violent crime. The rest of it, 96%, is spent on things like um, driving on suspended licenses, civil forfeiture, trespassing by people who are unhoused, um, dealing with responding to mental health crises, um, the vast bulk of what police are doing, right? And so um, when we think about like re-evaluating the expenditures that our culture is, 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 um, putting into to sort of violent, punitive responses like police, you have to remember that the police themselves aren't even telling us that they're that they're spending their time and resources on violent crime. And you look at a place like Ferguson. Mm-hmm. When I got to Ferguson, the city averaged 3.6 arrest warrants per household. Imagine that. I mean, has there ever been uh, a society in world history where you could say something like that, where government agents who are armed have the power to arrest 3.6 people for every household. Um, almost all of those warrants were for unpaid debt to the city because Ferguson, like many other cities, like the ones you mentioned a few minutes ago, across the country have converted their local municipal police force into a mechanism of revenue generation through low level arrests and through traffic citations. And that's how you got to the point in Ferguson where there was an arrest warrant out um, for so many people that there were 2.2 of them out for every single adult. And um, in my investigation there, um, uh, along with our amazing partners there in St. Louis, our city defenders and, and many others, we uncovered that, that the vast majority of these were for black people. Mm-hmm. And the vast, vast majority of them were for black people living in poverty. And, and that's the reality of what police do in this country. There's no way of dressing that up nicely. That is what we have police do in this country. And you can look at it uh, as well, like I t- discussed in the book, um, uh, when you think about like the war on drugs as another example. Um, and this is why, you know, some people say that the criminal justice system, which is a term I don't use, I always use the criminal injustice system or the criminal punishment bureaucracy. A lot of people say that is broken, right? Well, it's only broken if you think that its goals are things like human flourishing and equality and justice. But if you think that its goals are control and surveillance and punishment, um, and sort of senseless violence that actually benefits the wealthiest people in our society, it's actually functioning extremely well. And the war on drugs is a great example. Um, many um, drugs in this that are now criminalized used to be uh, perfectly legal. So um, opium was legal until the powers that be, the ruling class elites, wanted to give police an excuse to crack down on Chinese immigrants. Um, marijuana was legal until the ruling class elite wanted to give police a, a, a way of using their discretion to crack down on Mexican American immigrants. Cocaine was legal in this country until the ruling class elites wanted to give police the authority to use their discretion to target black people. And the reason I say use their discretion is that at every stage in this country's history, many rich white people were using opium, were using cocaine, were using marijuana, but everybody understood that if we make them illegal, the police will only enforce those laws against the poorest people and the particularly particular immigrant or racial groups that, that they wanted to. And so we have a situation now where we embark on this war on drugs in the late, you know, mid, early, late 60s, especially in the 1970s. And after 50 years of the war on drugs, we have caged um, almost 50 million people for hundreds of millions of years. We've surveilled all of the world's communications. We've totally basically eradicated privacy in the Fourth Amendment. We've firebombed and chemically sprayed huge swaths of Latin America, right? We've separated tens of millions of children from their parents. Um, we have we have raided homes and killed tens of thousands of people like Breonna Taylor, right? We've, we've seized billions of dollars of people's property and civil forfeiture. I could go on, right? And after all of that, drug usage rates are higher. 
drugs are more potent. Children are using drugs at higher rates and, and, and overdoses from drugs at our all time highs. So it's not that the people that control the system are just stupid, right? It's not that they look at this and they say, you know, everything that we've been doing is actually not um, meeting our goals. Um, they're actually quite sophisticated. They know exactly what they're doing. Like, and it's just that the purpose isn't to reduce drug usage and the purpose isn't to have thriving communities. The purpose is to control and cage and punish certain groups of people. And, and if you look at the war on drugs from that metric, it's actually been quite effective. And I, I want to keep on that thread. I just wanted to make sure that people can see this because I, I realized I didn't share it the first time. This is uh, the map of the, of the United States that shows cities and towns that receive significant revenue from fines and fees. Um, and you can see one, it's it's highly concentrated in the poorest parts of the country, which are the South, uh, which is the South, um, along with the Midwest, right? Um, I think that it's very worth noting, um, you know, that role in it, not that it's only coming from city governments, of course, but the fact is, is that this is something that comes into like ma like a mass trend of like disinvestment from communities and cities that they also rely on the police to terrorize people. Absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, well I just wanted to move now. So mm -hmm. there's some awareness of this, I think, among people in general, a growing one to the extent you get like, uh, and maybe wait in a twilight zone, but in this pendulum now between this sort of dangerous reform rhetoric of sort of, sort of the establishment or politicians and then the uh, pro cop just mendacity and stenography. So let's stick with the uh, sort of pro reform arguments uh, uh, briefly. Um, like what, are, what uh, concerns you about like, I guess, this uh, like like the pro reform consensus. Well, throughout the history of this country, um, people who own things have used the language of reform. Um, whenever there is a significant groundswell of, of opposition to the to some form of injustice, they have co opted that energy and used the language of reform. Um, to, to create new systems that reproduce the same injustices with a different label. So, for example, um, let's just take a few modern examples, right? Um, uh, body cameras by, on police. Um, that was something that police themselves wanted. They're really a dream for police departments because they now give pol every police officer in the country a surveillance camera that they control. Um, so instead of asking questions like, why are the police in this neighborhood and why are police responding to things like mental health crises and, and homelessness, et, et cetera, and poverty? Um, let's just have the police go to the same poor um, neighborhoods of color as, as they've always been going to. And let's just videotape them as they brutalize people. And by the way, the police can turn their cameras on and off and control the evidence. And this will be an incredible way for police whenever they want to, to have irrefutable evidence that they can prosecute some poor person with. So it's like the video shows the person possessing that drug. So instead of asking questions like, why are we caging people for possessing that list, that plant that's on the list of plants you can't possess, um, we now have an airtight video that can get a conviction of that person. And but the problem for police was that they couldn't get enough money um, to pay billions of dollars in technology costs to equip every cop in the country with a surveillance camera. So what do they do? They use their own violence as an excuse to partner with liberal reformist politicians to, to make body cameras a civil rights issue for poor people. And that kind of diabolical um, way of getting billions of dollars in funding for police departments that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten and that distracted everyone from the real questions about what are police doing and why um, uh, ended up as the sort of common reform that was pushed in particular by, by the Obama Justice Department, which gave grants uh, all over the country, but also that was pushed by Democrat mayors all over the country. And so, you know, you could go on and on. You know, another example of a reform is probation and parole. Those were seen as reforms to allow people to get out of prison more. That, that, they were pitched to everyone as a reform of the sort of the tough on uh, crime and long sentences. Now, um, we have more people on probation and parole by a factor of two than people that are in prison. And probation and parole violations, technical violations, so not even um, people committing a new crime, just people breaking some rule, like don't drink alcohol or, mm -hmm. or have a job or like show up to a meeting at a certain time. That's 25% of all people sent to state prison in this country every year is people on technical violations of probation and parole. These are people who aren't even accused of committing a new crime. So 
the reform actually became the leading cause of imprisonment. Um, I could go on and on and on. The same is true with electronic monitoring, which is which is this new world of electronic incarceration. The same is true of actually prisons itself. Prisons were sold to us as a reform from older, more harsh punishments, right? Um, so at every single turn, um, there's a, a whole movement now of, of so-called bail reform, which is actually being pushed by, by police unions, bail bond industries, private equity companies, and sort of centrist Democratic and centrist Republican politicians that is really an attempt to reproduce all the injustices of the money bail system with different labels. So instead of jailing someone because they can't pay cash bail, people will just be jailed outright. And instead of buying a bail bond to get your loved one out of jail, your loved one gets out of jail for free, but you have to pay a company to monitor them with an ankle bracelet. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extracting the same money from the same populations. All of this is called reform. I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. Man, yeah. I mean, so do you do you agree with me that there seems to be a pendulum shift between like I remember all the Koch brothers were pro reform stuff from like five years ago, but now I've I've like it seems like the mainstream media and liberal press and stuff is going back to a more tough on crime, um, uh, you know, fear mongering uh, messaging. Uh, is that how you mark it too? Absolutely. Um, I have not seen anything like what we're seeing now in the entire time I've been following this for the last 15 years. Wow. Of course, um, a lot of the assumptions, attitudes, and beliefs of the mainstream media have always been very supportive of the carceral state because they support fundamentally inequality in our society. Um, but there is no question that the uprisings last summer, and in particular, the demand to reduce um, the funding of police departments Mm -hmm. touched off a very um, um, a alarming um, nerve in the sort of status quo elite. And what we've seen is a full on media bombardment of propaganda um, in every conceivable way, lying about crime going up, um, lying about violent crime going up, doing stuff that is just absolutely unfounded, like at the level of like climate change denial, like the media is constantly linking crime and policing and crime and imprisonment. So you have all these stories sort of like speculating that an increase in crime, which is again, made up, um, that this increase in crime is caused by like lower sentences or like divestment from police where police weren't divested from. And the most robust finding in all of the criminological science is that sentences of incarceration do not reduce crime. That is like a scientific fact um, as robust as any other fact in the social sciences. Every review of the last 50 years, every meta study, every conservative, every liberal, every criminologist has found this, right? And yet we have the media suggesting to people that being too lenient in punishment is actually causing crime. This is climate change denial level propaganda. Um, it, it, it's, it's reminiscent of the, the Central Park Five coverage, the super predator coverage of the, of the early and mid 90s. And, and I think it, it's profoundly um, dangerous um, because it is creating in, in the public um, a sense of um, real confusion and, and, and inaccurate understanding of like, what are the things that actually lead to health and safety? And you know, those things, what the research shows is that health and safety are connected to things like inequality, um, the availability of medical care, the availability of housing, programming for kids, like um, after school programs, theater, music, art, poetry, athletics, um, things that connect people to other people in their neighborhoods. Those are the things that actually produce safety. You know, the, the, the idea that like, um, that all of the gender-based violence in our society is caused by not enough police when, you know, by most estimates um, and surveys, you know, police are one of the biggest perpetrators of gender-based violence mm -hmm. in this country, right? Um, and not, and, and the idea that, that we need more police instead of confronting inequality and, and toxic masculinity and like the actual systemic causes of gender-based violence, most of which is intimate partner violence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's nothing to do with with the, the number of police. And in fact, what we've seen um, in scandal after scandal in city after city across this country is police deliberately ignored 
uh, rave kits and refused to test them and instead chose to divert their resources to drug stops, traffic stops, um, patrolling and arresting homeless people so they can get more overtime cash. Um, so just the, 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 the level of media propaganda around what police actually do um, and, and, and why that is not connected to safety has been really alarming. I mean, I think I've just been seeing this all around because I'm in Austin, Texas, and, you know, we're having a big fight right now over over Prop A, which this is going to premiere uh, tomorrow on Wednesday. So that will be we'll know the results by then. So we'll see what happens with the, with the vote. But the way that campaign has been run. Um, so for people who aren't familiar, you know, Prop A is basically trying to force a city to increase police, um, the amount of police that are hired by the city. Um, to an arbitrary number, a number which is, you know, again, not borne out by any kind of studies. And it's it's a it's it's been proposed by a front group for the Travis County um, GOP. Right. Um, so it's you know, it's being used as a wedge issue um, to sort, sort of try to, you know, draw support for Republican policies in the future. But anyways, the thing that's so frustrating about the way that it's been covered in the local media is like, one, you just basically, uh, you know, are getting reports straight from the police union, you know, published as, as fact in local media. Um, same thing with the group behind Prop A, which is Save Austin Now, which keeps on, which presents itself as a nonpartisan group. But it's like it's like location is in the Travis County County, like GOP, <laughs> like office, their leaders, the, uh, you know, the head of the Travis County GOP, et cetera. Um, but anyways. It, 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 the thing that's sort of frustrating for me, right? So we like, obviously the right wing's trying to utilize this, right? Um, but it, it, it's frustrating when you do see like, you know, Austin is a very liberal city, you know, democratic run city council, democratic mayor, et cetera. Um, and when it comes to like trying to address these kind of fundamental um, issues of safety, like you were talking about, like these programs, um, there just is not enough. There, it just doesn't seem that that's like what's leading, um, you know, the fight back against these kind of more right wing, more policing narratives. Right. Um, what's so sinister about the Prop A uh, here in Austin is that if they if it does win, it means that they're going to have to cut the city budget, which means less funding for after school programs, less funding for all these other you know important, um, important things. But I, I bring it up because it's like it's a double crisis in the sense that like the right wing is certainly trying to use this because they're nasty and they want to have you know more police uh, abusing people. But it also comes from a kind of you know Democratic Party lack of investment in communities and willingness to really take big stands. So that we're always basically just on the defensive, right? When we get these assaults, um, we're sort of I don't know we're like five steps behind because we're just basically trying to prevent them from taking away already existing after school funding or after school community funding rather than expanding those in the first place if that makes any sense absolutely I, I think there's a few different like points to be made here one is that um many mainstream democrats have been so thoroughly propagandized by this the last 50 years of, of unprecedented mass human caging we, we all to some degree in order to become the society that cages people at five to ten times the rate of other countries around us and five times the rate of our own historical average, we had to adopt a number of, of attitudes, beliefs, assumptions about the world that are deeply flawed, that most people around the world don't believe, that aren't true, um, but that serve a very powerful interest. And so shaking those is very, very difficult. Number two, most media is controlled by people who benefit from these arrangements, um, particularly the corporate media. And so you, you're dealing with uh, overall desensitization of human caging, um, a lack of understanding of the actual facts and research, um, and, and also nefarious actors who benefit from it, who are controlling the way most media is presented. And then I think you, you know you've got this other thing that's happening in these local political fights, which is that local political machines, whether they be Democrat or Republican, are heavily dependent on um, not just police and jail guard unions, but also on real estate developers. And real estate developers provide a huge portion of the campaign funds in local, you know, democratic politics. And the people that are that are most pro police, that most want this kind of massive, low level, um, discretionary kind of policing, are the developers who want to be able to use that police force as a sort of privatized security uh, force to keep out sort of people they think are undesirable to, to the neighborhoods that they're trying to increase property values. 
Uh, with all this in mind, let's talk a little bit about the uh, promise and limitations of progressive DAs. Um, you know, I support you know Larry Krasner, for instance, to the extent that he's definitely better than maybe a, a GOP or a standard Democrat. Um, but there's also, I think, you know, there, it's an uphill battle uh, to say the uh, very least. So, what's your perspective on uh, DAs? Um, I think it's it's always better for DAs to be less harsh. So I'm I'm supportive of any DA, any DA's policy that's going to put fewer human beings in cages, it's going to separate fewer children from their parents, that's going to end these cycles of trauma and violence that are actually increasing trauma and violence in the future. We, we, we know that imprisonment actually increases violence in the future. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I support that. I, I think where I sort of differ from a lot of other folks is that I don't see a progressive prosecutor as any kind of long-term panacea or solution to the problems of this system mm -hmm. um, for a lot, for a number of reasons, you know, first and, and, and most basically like um, the, the prosecutor has a certain set of tools and those tools tend to be carceral, like they put people in cages and they convict people of crimes. And many of the solutions that our society actually needs aren't punishing more people, it's investing in a really deep way in the things that actually help communities thrive. And DAs just don't have the power to do that. They're kind of irrelevant um, to that. Secondly, like if I, I, I think that while the, the theory behind the progressive prosecutor movement is that over the last 30, 40 years, prosecutors became the most powerful actor in the criminal legal system. But that theory is true only because over the last 30, 40 years, prosecutors have been willing and, and readily uh, able to use their power to crush poor people and people of color and immigrants. And if I did a couple of events with progressive prosecutors over the last year, and I, I pointed out to them that, like, let's just take the, the new progressive prosecutor in Austin. Texas, for example, if that person said, you know what, um, we have um, a lot of wage theft in Austin. In fact, wage theft around the country is, is worth 50 to $100 billion a year. It, it dwarfs by a factor of five, all burglary, shoplifting, car theft, robbery, all other property crime combined. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop prosecuting shoplifting and those things. I'm going to focus my resources on the much bigger problem I'm going to prosecute all the employers in Austin for wage theft because they all do it every single day, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then that prosecutor said, you know what? Um, we have a lot of unhoused people in Austin, but we also have a lot of people like Elon Musk who have seven or eight houses or 15 or 20 extra bedrooms in their house. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to prosecute trespassing for anyone who, who is unhoused and needs shelter. Um, if they want to go stay in... in, in someone else's place who has um, an extra of more than three bedrooms, they can stay there. I'm not going to prosecute them for trespassing because it's morally wrong. It's kind of like a Jean Valjean situation from Les Miserables. Right? I'm, I'm not going to prosecute that crime because prosecuting a poor person for being poor is unjust. And you can imagine progressive prosecutors saying something like that. I guarantee you, if that person declined to enforce trespassing laws that wealthy property owners depend on, they would immediately become the least powerful actor in the criminal system. The voters might recall them. The governor and the Texas legislature would call an emergency session and they would, you know, pass a yeah, law yeah. saying, you know, right. So like you, the, the, there's no way of getting around the fact that the policing and prosecution systems in this country exist to enforce inequality. Mm -hmm. They are the reason that a person struggling for food with their family can't go into a grocery store and take what they need. They are the reason that the manufacturers of insulin make billions of dollars a year because people who need insulin um, aren't able to just take what they need. They have to pay for it. If they can't pay for it, they die, right? And, and all of that is enforced through, through property laws that are only like respected and enforced because they are backed by the force and violence of the state. And so as long as you have a, a very unequal society, the role of police prosecutors and jails and judges and, 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 and prisons is going to be to enforce that inequality. And so progressive prosecutors are not a panacea to those problems, even though they can and should reduce the levels of incarceration in this country back to, let's say, you know, as a start, 1970 levels. Then we can start arguing about about that from there. But I, I don't think they're a panacea. 
And I, I would just add, you know, to that, it's like, well, the, the wave that we've seen is positive, And I hope that it's the beginning of just a movement that will be able to, you know, take over the system. I mean, it's, it's also something that's, you know, unfortunately, likely in a lot of places to be temporary, right? You, you win an election here and there, then you lose it. And then it goes back to being an extremely oppressive um, office as well, right? They just, they're able to revert those things back really quickly to be being as, as cruel as possible. Those bureaucracies are designed for a certain purpose. They are designed to be mass assembly line um, human cagers. They are designed to process bodies. And so they're very easy to repurpose. Um, if someone comes in and changes a policy saying, you know, we're not going to cage people who are unhoused just for the crime of surviving, they're, the, all of the office infrastructure is still in place. Mm -hmm. And the next person comes in, changes the policy, then it's right back to business as usual. And I do mean business because it's a very highly profitable business. Um, is there any other uh, areas around the country you think we should look at uh, in addition to Austin? I think everywhere has its own um, very interesting and very important stuff happening in these areas. There's 3,163 local jails and there are 3,163 groups of people, I guarantee you, in every single one of those places struggling to um, get the jail to respect the basic dignity of their loved ones held inside. And um, there are movements all over this country to reduce the reliance on police as prosecutors, judges, and cages. And, and um, I think there's really exciting stuff happening. I think some of the most exciting stuff that I've seen recently is happening in Los Angeles. Um, there's an incredible movement led by local organizers in Los Angeles, part of the Justice LA Coalition, um, who've managed to get the county through ballot measure and through lots of other organizing and, and sort of behind the scenes policy work to make concrete commitments of, of redirecting resources from the carceral bureaucracies um, at the level of hundreds of millions of dollars to um, things that communities need to thrive, like we talked about earlier. That's very exciting. If, if what's happening in LA can be reproduced mm -hmm. across California, can be reproduced in other um uh, big urban areas, I think it's very exciting. So I, I'm really excited about what's happening in LA. Uh, I'm really excited about the various um, jail closure campaigns. Not only did they stop a multi-billion dollar jail from being constructed in Los Angeles, but they're working on closing the workhouse in St. Louis, which is very exciting. They're, you know, they're working on, on um, the aftermath of the closed Rikers campaign. And I think what happens next in New York City, whether Rikers is shut down or not, will be fascinating. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got cities like Dallas and Houston, whose jail populations are, are expanding to, to record levels through a combination of just a very harsh kind of cartoon villain-like prosecutors and judges um, who, who are ruthlessly using cash bail to fill their jails to, 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 to levels that are, you know, yesterday um, we just got word that the 18th person this year has died in the jail in downtown Houston. And this is a jail that has fake windows because it's more important for people in Houston to see a nice building with windows from the outside than it is to have people on the inside with sunlight. And, and when you have that level of cruelty, um, you, you know, it, it's hard to know where to begin. But, but And yet there are incredible organizers and activists and others throughout the Houston area and Harris County, Texas, um, who who are fighting against that, that and, and making real progress and, and, and in little ways here and there. And I think there's a growing movement like that in many cities. So I, I, I think for your listeners, I would recommend wherever you live, whether it's Pittsburgh, where there's incredible energy now around, around mutual aid and jail support and bail funds um, to the West coast in Portland, where there's incredible organizing happen, find out who in your community is working on these issues? Who is working on closing the jail? Who is a, working in a mutual aid group that is helping people um, put stuff they need on their commissary accounts? Who's helping people whose children and loved ones and spouses are, are confined in the jail? Who is doing the local court watch program that's watching what judges are doing? Who's working on the local bail fund? There are people doing this work every single day and they need help. And so one exciting thing is like, just Find out where you, these issues are also local, you know, find out who's doing this organizing work, where you are, who's already working on it and see how you can help. 
And uh, one final thing. I know we have uh, a small, but uh, it's there, uh, law student sort of audience. And your book addresses uh, people in law sort of directly. What's your message uh, now? Or what should people know going into this field? Because it, it always strikes me like we had um, Stephen Robbins on. He's a uh, immigration lawyer. And it seems to me like a similar sort of thing. Like, how do you confront a system that is so monstrous and cruelty? <laughs> It's really hard. And, and lawyers have been, a, unfortunately, a huge part of constructing that architecture of oppression. And I think, you know, the first piece of advice to law students is never allow yourself through the propagandistic legal education that you're receiving to become one of those people who is desensitized to things that should shock you to the core. Mm -hmm. Because what our legal system does to people and their bodies and their families is abhorrent. And one of the major goals of three years of law school is to get you through a variety of, of head fakes and um, sort of intellectual um, dishonesty um, and sheer bombardment uh, of normalization is to get you to stop caring about that stuff and to get you to think that it's natural, that it has to happen, that there are reasons for it um, other than politics. Um, and so I think you know that's the first and, and most important piece of advice. And, and, and the second piece of advice is do something with your career that you're passionate about and that meets some of the enormous need. Mm -hmm. um, this country spends more money on Halloween costumes for pets than it does on civil legal aid for the poor um, at a federal level. And so we have an enormous need for lawyers in every area of law you can imagine, whether it's helping resist environmental catastrophe, whether it's immigration, the criminal law, civil rights, wage and hour work for employment, labor law. Um, there are in, an incredible uh, variety of careers you can choose that actually help people. And, that, and, that, and, and then you can do that work in a way that is respectful of and coordinated with and in service of social movements that are actually trying to build power in the groups that are most harmed by these systems. And you could do that, or you could do what most lawyers do and, and further these systems and work on behalf of wealthy interests. And you have to make a decision about what you want for your life. All right. Well, Alec Karakatsanis, author of Usual Cruelty, The Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Justice System and founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps at Equality Alec on Twitter. Thank you so much, Alec. Thank you so much for having me. I'll talk to you all soon. We are back. Hello, David. Hey, man. I really enjoyed that conversation. It was actually a perfect compliment to the the stuff that was happening here in Austin on the ballot that day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Alec is a guy who's uh, you know stared into the abyss, I think, uh, a little bit, and uh, he's very uh, comes back with clarity on the, mm -hmm. on the matter. And his book is really phenomenal because not only does it deal with a lot of the kind of practical elements of, you know, human caging or carceral state, et cetera, um, but I actually think it has a pretty uh, deep sort of wrestling with law and society and sort of speaking a little bit more in like plain terms. Um, I don't know the way, like the way a lot of people talk about law in, in the U.S., um, sort of ignores the fact that these are like social systems, right? They're yeah. not things that we sort of inherited from like God. These are sort of man-made creations, which right. means when the law is unjust, um, you know, there's, we can 
do stuff about it, right? <laughs> we don't have yeah. to accept these things as like the natural order of the world. And I think, I don't know, it's a small thing, but actually making that point, I think, is, is really crucial. Yeah, although um, believing this uh, one with God probably makes it easy to sleep at night after you lock up so, man. <laughs> a person for 90 years. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think so. I mean, you have to. I mean, other than that, um, then you're condemning people to uh, losing the one and only life that they have, right? Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's it's really um, awful. Just just the baseline amount of um, like the dystopia, right? Like it's it's so interesting to me how we have these sort of um, you know um, this whole media industry about horror and stuff like mm-hmm. and dystopia, but really, like I mean, come when you need to like. Okay, we'll get rid of bond, um, um, having to pay bond um, to get released, but you have to pay a private company now to track you. Like, mm-hmm. what What are we talking about here? Like, is Tom Cruise going to bust the window? Um, but, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not a reform at all, right? If you're, yeah, I mean, the, the, the attachment of, of the profit motive to the already horrific American prison system is, is a, a nightmare within a nightmare. Yeah. Well, talking about good things, let's talk about some good things because right here um, in the great state of Texas, deep in the heart of Texas, Austin, Texas, baby, uh, we had a really great night last night in our um, our local elections, primarily in shutting down Prop A. And this is just a really crucial fight and a really beautiful victory, and we're going to get into some of the, the bad characters um surrounding it in a second um but it was a really critical fight because for people who aren't you know familiar what's been happening um in austin austin like many places around the country you know has been sort of facing the brunt of this affordability crisis which is caused by mass inequality it's caused by a system that puts property values over human lives um you know and 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 it really especially for people who are from here like me and my family there has been this kind of crisis feeling of, you know, Austin sort of losing its soul, right? And that's a very classic thing. Talk about people from Austin like, oh, Austin was better 10 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera. I'm not getting into the cultural stuff. Um, I'm getting into the kind of cruelty, especially when it uh, when it comes to policing um, and, and and houseless folks, right? And, and this kind of right-wing movement um, that's been very well-funded um, has, over the past couple of years, you know, won a couple of big victories sort of pushing back against, you know, the city's more progressive bent, right? Um, anyway. I don't want to get a whole history lesson of the city of progressives and et cetera in Austin, but um, this group Save Austin Now that was able to implement a really, really brutal crackdown on homelessness um, in the city of Austin. Um, they tried to do even more, um, and they tried to force the city to increase the amount of police that it has on its payroll. Um, a completely arbitrary metric for how many police uh, that they were wanting the, the city to hire. Um, but they basically were trying to push this kind of you know law and order, conservative freak out um, politics and take it as far as they could. And it got repudiated big time big time last night um, by a vote, I think, of the from what I was seeing before we were coming in, um, something like 69 to 31 um, people voted against Prop A, which was basically a proposal that was going to increase the amount of police, I think about two extra police for every 1,000 citizens here, right? Um, it was cooked up by this group called Save Austin Now, uh, which presents itself as a... Um, nonpartisan, you know, just sort of citizen initiative group, um, but it's effectively run and controlled by the Travis County GOP. Um, anyway, uh, you know, through the work of a lot of folks, uh, this was sort of was was shot down in, in pretty impressive fashion. And let me share this uh, right quick from the Texas Observer, which for folks in Texas, this is a publication you should definitely be, definitely be following. Um, Gus Bova here says, Awesome voters reject proposal to superfund police in victory for, for progressives. Um, on Tuesday evening, voters in the state's capital resoundingly rejected a proposal to bloat the city's police budget at a cost of up to $600 million over five years. The measure would have mandated a staffing ratio of two sworn cops for every 1,000 Austin residents, among other requirements. Uh, the proposal, a brainchild of Save Austin, now a local reactionary <laughs> coalition, including... Um, the police union and the Travis County GOP chair failed Tuesday by a 69 to 31 margin. Um, 
I want to get some of our, our good folks in here. This is a good piece. Um, you know, Tuesday's ballot item to overfund the police. I like that uh, framing. Um, also, a citizen-initiated ballot measure drew the ire of other public sector employee groups who uh, predicted the new money would come from their own budget. Even the firefighter and EMS unions, often political allies of police unions, campaigned against the policy. Save Austin Now and the Austin Police Association tried to drum up support by scaremongering about a recent increase in homicides in Austin. Um, let me get here. I want to make sure that we get... Uh, uh, Seneca's uh, quote. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, Seneca, if you're not familiar, one, um, oh, Jesus, um, does great work here in Austin. It's also a guest on Left Reckoning and uh, I believe Majority Report as well as TMBS as well. well. Let me just make sure we're getting it. Here we go. Um, at a cooperatively uh, run brew pub in North Austin, a lefty crowd gathered to celebrate the election results before a rendition of the labor song Solidarity Forever. Seneca Savoy of the Austin uh, DSA, one of the various groups that canvassed against Save Austin now addressed the crowd of about 75. We celebrate today and we work to build the structures that prevent them from ever winning again. Savoy told the told the crowd um save austin now uh, did not simply trip over their own feet they were defeated and i really <laughs> that framing is, is important nice. um too uh i want to get into some of the villains in a second but i before we uh, go too far just while we're in this piece um matt uh, mackawack mackawack however you say his name um who's the travis county gop chair the leader of save austin now this guy's been sort of trying to push this nonsense um i think gus Bove Gus uh, Bova sort of gives everybody a clear picture of who this kind of guy is. Meanwhile, at an event preemptively deemed an election night victory party, uh, Matt McCoyak, uh, the Travis <laughs> County Republican chair and co-founder of Save Austin, now took the stage to discuss defeat. For uh, McCoyak, uh, the, the last two years of cultivating fear for, of the homeless and crime have raised his political profile and stature as a fundraiser. Save Austin now raised nearly $2 million uh, prime prior to the homeless uh camping vote and $1 million in just the last month. His own public relations firm has profited handsomely, right? Remember, there's always grubbers with this shit, um, has profited ham handsomely. And he reportedly enjoys a life split um, between Austin and, uh, is that a Texas city? Um, the city of Miami, Florida. Um, and in an October profile in the Austin American Statesman, McCoyax had said that if his police funding measure were to fail, he might leave Austin altogether. Um, so Something that I think we would all be very happy about. Yet That's a trip. Like, yeah, if, if I don't win Minnesota, I'm never coming back here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yet in his Tuesday night concession speech, he struck a more defiant tone after a touch-and-go analogy to Michael Jordan, who failed over and over again. <laughs> Koyak uh, promised to okay. keep fighting for city council seats and to perhaps try another ballot initiative, initiative next year. We're not going to save Austin ne t now tonight, but we will. Um, not only save Austin then. <laughs> what? <laughs> save Austin now. Now save Austin then. Yeah, save Austin. I mean, it's a it's a it's a good victory um, to prevent needless police funding. And you know, the thing that was so notable about the the campaign that made me really happy. And you know, I, I only did this uh, once or twice, but you know, when I was able to talk to people on the phones uh, doing phone banking um, for uh, for the vote no um, campaign. It was interesting to talk to folks who really didn't like this group overstepping themselves. And basically, I remember talking to a guy who said he voted for, you know, the the more reactionary um, homeless ban, which was, you know, a travesty. Um, but he said that, you know, he he felt that they've now moved from sort of asking questions to people to trying to control the city. Right. Again, um, I would disagree with that framing in general, but it was, uh, I, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that like the fact that it was such an overwhelming no vote was a, a good indication that, I don't know, this kind of right wing turn that we've seen them have some success with, uh, might not be as long lived as some of us sort of had feared. It's important to know, like, it's great to know how much extra room we have to run and the limits of that stuff. Like, I think this yeah. is the same with CRT. Like, I think everyone's running to blame CRT for Terry McAuliffe um, losing in Virginia. At the same time, like, I don't know if we're going to play this clip now or in the post game, but, like, uh, there's this clip where um, Anderson Cooper wants to blame socialists. And Van Jones is like, you undercutted any economic appeal this guy could make. Like, all he had to do was say, actually, parents, you don't have a say in your kid's school, right? Which is not a great message um, <laughs> as a politician. And and, and so, like, I, I think, and, and there's countervailing, I tweeted about 
uh, last night, but there's in Colorado, the CRT stuff didn't lead to any, actually there's depressed turnout among Republicans. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and there's, there's a, so we don't want to like, we've talked about T a fair bit on the show, but like, I think that's credibility to say, don't freak out about it to the extent that like it overrides everything. If you had a stronger message in uh, Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. and it wasn't this like waffling bullshit, like maybe, who knows, maybe you would have won that. I, I'm not going to make any uh, promises because Virginia seems to, the, the other thing is Virginia always seems to go against the new president in, mm -hmm. in those, uh, governor races. So who really, I, I think there's a little bit, uh, over, um, interpretation going on there because of who it probably serves. Um, I think so. But yeah, I mean that, that, um, past the, uh, the, um, question two in Minneapolis about that was so-called defund, but was really sort of a public safety thing toward maybe defunding some time, but none of the politicians really actually had a commitment to that, right? That mm -hmm. failed, and like the cops are happy because they think it's a big like vote of confidence, right? But like uh, ultimately, um, the, the struggles are bigger than that. Like I said, like um, Robin Wanzi Warlabaugh won as an independent socialist, and then um, to contrast that with the disappointment with India Walton. Mm -hmm. which is very disappointing that she lost to a, a, a on to ben brown on a write-in candidate right and that says some of the, the, the that really i think illustrates the uphillness of taking over the democratic party even if you can beat them in a primary that said like i i think it's it's also the case that none of us would know who india walton was if, if she just run, uh, ran as a writing candidate during the general right she would have got like a percentage or two and so mm -hmm. we would have never had this discussion about india walton holding winning the primary which turns out not actually uh shooting to winning the election but uh yeah yeah no i mean i think uh, on the wall and maybe we'll get into maybe virginia more in, in just a second but like i think on the walton um stuff uh, uh bronco uh, march of teach had a really good piece in jackman sort of breaking down one you know some of the things that you would expect about wealth and power in the city of Buffalo and who showed up, but also making the point that, you know, these machines take a while to, to be built. And we're talking, when we're talking about Brown's machine in, in Buffalo, that took decades to, to build. And that doesn't mean that we can't have victories right now and immediately, but sort of understand that some of these things can be very deeply um, entrenched. And it takes that kind of long view work to be able to build things that can defend all of our gains um, alongside, you know, getting new ones for, for working people. Um, but I don't know. Before we get more into that stuff in, in, in Virginia, I do just want to take one last victory lap here in Austin, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. You know. um, I want to share one more. Um, <laughs> Pekowiak, Makawak. So I'm probably, I mean, I, I'm hedging my bets, I guess. Makawak. Um, I don't want to learn it, frankly. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to forget. But um, boy, is Cope. Boy is like injecting some straight up copium. And okay. uh, Gus Bova was talking about, you know, he gave this prolonged, prolonged speech about Michael Jordan. Um, and uh, I just want to can can just pause on that. So he's yeah. he's he, so this is he's his Michael Jordan in the 80s. Like I guess so, man. Where where he's like it's scoring like thirty five points a game and like just destroying everyone, but like not able to play as a team. Like I, I'm just trying to understand. Like who are the, who are the Pistons? He didn't make his uh, his you know his high school team. Look, if Austin DSA is the bad boy Pistons, uh, then I think we're in <laughs> we're in pretty good shape. <laughs> well, our boy is coping hardcore, and I just want to you know continue to join in the fun. Um, this is him last night. Um, quoting everyone's favorite uh, boy, uh, Winston Churchill. And oh, now course, it's not yeah. the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So a nice little riddle there um, for all who are interested in it. I will just say to, to Matt and all of those assholes over there in the Travis County GOP, cope harder. Um, yeah. but before we move on, there is one more person that I do want to um, highlight and, and call out. Another person who is trying to push you know, a certain kind of reactionary narrative. Well, actually, before I get there, I do just want to note when I was starting to feel really confident um, that, that it was going to be a no vote, Matt, um, mm -hmm. on Prop A here. Yeah. Was when um, McElwag and all those freaks started really pushing these these kind of gruesome crime stories, right? Um, and that was pretty much all that they were doing was just, you know, telling them about right. bad things that have been happening to people in the community, uh, which again is just such a low kind of way to to run a campaign but the to me it sort of shit. Shit, they didn't have much to go on um anymore because they realized that they were losing ground folks um because the the prop a campaign um 
sorry, the uh, the vote no on Prop A campaign was fairly um, positive. I mean, it had a defensive posture in the sense of saying, like, don't let this bad thing happen to us. But it was saying, um, don't let them increase the police budget at all. Uh, the expense of all of these other programs are very cru- crucial to you. Both things, you know, emergency services like firefighters and EMS, but, you know, after school programs, et cetera, like things that benefit the community. And it was able to craft a narrative. I think that was like really inspiring people to say like, hey, let's protect the best parts of the city and this community and maybe even expand them and not just, you know, send in more armed people um, to, to harass folks. Um, but I wanted to highlight uh, an unfortunate new member of our community here, um, who is just wrong as hell, and I always love taking a moment to celebrate um, when this asshole is wrong. Um, frankly, he is a lot. Um, maybe let's start here before we get to my commentary on him. Um, but little Elon, um, mm. somebody who, in my opinion, has doesn't give a shit about Texas. This is somebody who, when he first came here um, with his Gigafactory, negotiated tax breaks to the, um, that were you know on taxes that were supposed to go to the school system around here, upwards of sixty eight million dollars. Um, you know, who somehow is very very concerned about the state of of Austin. Zaid Jelani, everybody knows him. He's a quack. Um, he's a hack. Quack. Um, but Elon Musk, in his kind of typical way, just sort of jumping in here and saying, Austin should be its own city, not a San Francisco copycat. Yeah, I can't sure, imagine. Just, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just read. If you scroll up a little bit, I'll read what Zaid says. Oh, yeah, um, thank you, you. Can you control plus to make it a little bit bigger? Um, uh, Austin implemented one of its biggest uh, police budget cuts. Their homicide rate soared over the pe- next year. And today, the surge uh, is larger than most of the country. Uh, now voters will decide to boost the ranks of the police. So again, like, yeah, oh, for Fox News, of course, as I do in the pro-cop yeah. stuff. I mean, I, that thing is like, let's, let's, let's be the edgy pro-cop people. But of course, yeah, Elon's a big follower. So, but like, that's, also, yeah. here are the people involved in this. Joe Rogan, uh, new Austinite. Elon Musk, new Austinite. I can't imagine... Um, if you're saying Austin should be its own city, not a San Francisco copycat, I can't imagine a worse argument for that than having a kind of bloated billionaire who's not from here, doesn't give a shit about this place, yeah, um, coming in here and South telling Africa. people what to do here if he doesn't want this city to be a copycat of San Francisco. Um, wasn't a particular dick, but <laughs> my response is pretty clear. <laughs> um, fucking ship off, jackass. Um, anyways, very happy that one prof a failed um, that... Uh, Macawag, who again did I note that he said that he would potentially yeah we did note that he said that he might have to leave Austin if Prop A fails. Um yeah, I think he should follow through on his threat. Um and it'd be great if he could take little Elon along with him. Um uh, did you see the Baker Mayfield did a story that was like uh was one of those pro like those cops pro cop statistics said like how much the murder rate soared. Baker um, Mayfield, the the quarterback? Yes, I believe that's, he's from I believe Austin. Right, what did right he say? so that makes sense. Yeah, but then he went to Oklahoma, I guess. So yeah, he did. He's a traitor. A um, traitor. Well, that makes a lot of sense that he would be. I did not see his interventions, but I don't know. Like, frankly, it was interesting because you did start to see this kind of national media interest in the race. At least some people trying to put their their finger on the scale one way or the other um and seeing that just be completely ignored i think is also a very very good thing i i think because i was worried about that i'm like damn if like fucking yeah so here's this um uh, i'll put it up here baker mayfield uh, instagram story and right that sort of shit and take the L Baker. Jesus yeah, so rich take- people are getting worked up. Um, rich people who have like very loose relationships with the city. I mean, you know, I don't want to take anything away from Baker. You know, he's from here, etc. I know he still lives here, um, but he also lives, um, you know, in Cleveland too, right? All these people who have one foot in, one foot out are very, yeah. very. You know, Elon Musk is barely in Austin in the first place. He always makes a big deal about the fact that he lives in was it Star City, Starbase, whatever the fuck, uh, Texas, that he's uh, re. Um, renamed without the consent of the people there poca chica down south texas i mean and 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 matt mcwiak um you know going in between here and miami all these people were very concerned about the safety of austin who seemed to pay um to spend almost you know less than half of the year in the city um, yeah well i mean yeah. they're they're particularly concerned with the 
parts of Austin that are their property. <laughs> I think so. And anyway, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some folks on um, from the campaign to give a little bit more of an in-depth look at it. But boy, I, I was saying to Matt yesterday before we went on, I was like, I don't know if I could spiritually take like another loss like that. So I'm fired up. I think that's good. good. I think it's a good springboard. And I like the way that Seneca frames it. This was not them falling um, or failing. This was us beating them. And I think that that's how we should take that energy going forward. Right on. Well, we promised it, so we have to do it. We have to talk a little bit about Virginia on the other side. Okay. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you hinted at some of your feelings about it. This is not going to be an in-depth um, breakdown, but I just sort of maybe rather than focusing on like a whole breakdown of what happened in that election, um, I just want to know two things, right? One, I'm sorry. McAuliffe sucks. He sucked for years. They were both cloud group guys. Both yeah, I mean, just rich assholes. McCullough is one of those, you know, random guys and people who aren't familiar with Virginia. I mean, I'd rather have somebody on from Virginia in the activist scene to talk more in depth about this. I'm just telling you my opinions of him because I lived in D.C. for a while when he was governor of Virginia. Um, you know, he is he represents a very specific kind of political class that I couldn't imagine dealing with if I was like a native Virginian, um, which is this kind of group of people who come and, you know, make money and get power in Washington, D.C. Um, but because they don't want to live in Washington, D.C. proper, they start to, you know, they live in Alexandria, you know, right. across the Potomac. Right. And then they start sort of trying to dictate the way that the rest of the state is coming. Anyways, this guy with no charisma, he also is not a left winger by any stretch of the imagination, centrist. And as Matt was mentioning earlier. There's deeply um, in bed with the same kind of financial um, interests as Yunkin, right? Um, but I did want to know because it was a big, it was a big loss, right? Um, I just wanted to share this map here, which I think people should take seriously. Um, you know what this does mean going forward. Um, here we go. This is the vote share from the New York Times. Uh, this is the move. <laughs> counties across Virginia and the the right wing shift in the state. As you see there, um, this blue arrow, that's a hypothetical because nowhere went more democratic um, in the state. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm looking at Richmond. Nope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe there's a blue, a little blue dot somewhere that I'm not seeing, but as people yeah. can see, the trends are very clear. And look, even in, you know, this is Al Arlington County, Alexander County, Fairfax, like this is all the Washington DC kind of Metro area. Right. And it's one direction. Um, right. And, Look, the, the Yunkin campaign is it was a despicable campaign. I mean, they focused on, you know, racial animus, etc. Um, I don't think that we should downplay that aspect of it and the fact that it does show a kind of reactionary event. Um, but I don't think that we can just be so glib as to sit here and say that that was the only thing, um, you know, that happened. Effectively, the Democratic Party in Virginia ran a campaign on one thing. Donald Trump, orange man, bad, um, which was what they did with Biden. And he, you know, sort of squeaked through in the end um, with that strategy. This is not something that is going to work um, forever. And it certainly is not going to work in, in context of, you know, governor um, races across the country, Senate races across the country, congressional races across the country. The fact that the Democratic playbook is so depleted right now, I think should make people very, very worried. And, um, their kind of attachment to running these centrist candidates who not only are uninspiring in their performance, their character and their vision, um, they're uninspiring because they are just very clear um, political party cronies. I mean, McCullough is not some guy who just sort of came up. He's like, oh, we uh, let's go for this random guy. And this is a Clinton boy, right? This right. Clinton boy who's been playing the game with that party for years and years and years, right? People know who he is. He's also a governor, right? Um, and look, yeah, so the CRT stuff is is certainly um, worrying. And Matt was mentioning it earlier. I mean, we've, we've done entire episodes about the threat of the CRT kind of backlash and the, the reason that it's the right wing playbook. But as Matt alluded to earlier, you got to be able to beat that shit. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like you got like everyone was dunking on that older guy. I mean, we should have had the video. Um, that older guy who is. <laughs> Uh, so the good liars here. clip where, yeah, they ask him like, "Hey, uh, what are you concerned about?" He's like, "I'm really concerned about. C I'm voting because of CRT." He's like, "What do you know about? It? I don't know really anything about it, but I know I don't like it." I so. know that, it, and also it's the most important thing. Like, I mean, that guy was uninspiring, almost as uninspiring as McAuliffe, right? Um, and the point there is that if that is like <laughs> what you're inspiring people, like they're like, "I don't really know, but I know it's the thing I have to do." 
then you're losing. Um, like you're losing in more ways than one. You're losing that election for sure, but you're also losing at like any kind of political vision um, that will be necessary to push back against. I mean, because the fact is, yeah, the CRT stuff is lies. The right wing lies. Fox News lie. Like this is the shit the liberals like to get worked about. It's like, oh, the right wing media lies to people all the time, right? But yeah, well, no shit. And you can't break through that stuff because it's very weak. Um, yeah. and, and the only reason that this stuff is effective is because all that you're doing, um, I mean, I, I should have had it prepared, but like the Democratic Party was sending out mailers across the state of Virginia. Of so we're blowing it. Oh did yeah, I that mean one? that, and also the uh, the Trump endorsement um, mailers. Did you see those? They were just no. like they looked like they came from the Republican Party. It was like Donald Trump endorses Yunkin, right? And it had like quotes of Donald Trump being like, "This is a great guy. These are the things that we want to do." Yeah, so, and it was paid for by the Democratic Party. Right, the Democratic Party is just putting out, you know, pro. This I mean, is whatever, like this is them so up their own ass because they like that's they want to run against Trump. Yunkin knew that they want to run against Trump, so he de-emphasized Trump. So they're like, okay, here, we got him now. Let's do this bullshit where we just advertise for him. And mm -hmm. like, as if, like, Republicans don't give a fuck that much. They might, like, depress turnout a little bit if he's too Trumpy, but they'll fucking go. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. And I don't know if you, you have a handy, Matt. I, I realize I don't have the that Cooper clip you're wanting to have us, if you could put that in the chat. Um, but while you're doing that, I want to show another kind of blunder here. Um, yeah. which this is Brian Grimm in the intercept. And this one is wild. This is next level stuff. Um, so this is, um, I think it came out earlier this morning, um, from Ryan Grimm at the intercept. Oh, God. Internal emails show how a Lincoln Project Tiki Torch stunt went wrong. So for people who are not familiar with this, I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with the imagery here. Um, they had these people sort of, you know, follow um, Youngkin's campaign around, you know, on the, the last few days of, of the election, holding Tiki Torches, you know, the idea is to sort of tie him to that, that movement. Um, but it was, it was a kind of bizarre sideshow. Um, it did not have the effect um that, that that the lincoln project right which is just like a i don't know a golden parachute for a bunch of piggish right wingers to continue making money yeah. after they have you know that that part of the, the country uh, that that political movement has full-on embraced you know <laughs> um you know complete reaction rather than veiled reaction um anyways the story here is that these democratic um that the lincoln project was sending these people around um the campaign itself had no idea about this and they were using these pictures right um going into the election saying like look at the people who are supporting him right but it was completely false um it was it was made up the people who were the paid actors who were supposed to do this the expectation was that people in the media were going to come up to them and, and investigate who they were with uh, which people weren't really doing so that message didn't get out and then democrats and republican uh, sorry democratic like operatives um started um tweeting out these photographs being like look at the people who he's surrounding himself with which created like like what's the thing matt that like republicans are fixated on right is that everybody is a paid protester everything is an op everything is theater right and essentially they gave that to them on a, like going into the elections like look they're trying to like pretend that we're racist they're trying to tell lies about us right yeah that's the lincoln project for you right there that's the disarray of that movement um not only i mean just strategically a blunder um but also like technically a blunder do you get what i mean yeah. like it was a bad idea in the first place but the the follow-through and the way that they put it out there was a complete disaster the fact that these people continue to get donations from from liberals across the country is amazing to me and frankly um it's a danger to the democratic party it um, is it really is i mean the, the evidence there is that's right before the election you give them like that narrative which not only plays into what you're saying but also like the exact like the trump derangement syndrome narrative which is like the er narrative of, of for reactionaries and all like everything that's going on whether it's like what any any sort of complaint whether it's like climate change or vaccine p it can be dismissed by oh that liberal is uh is overreacting about this stuff right and they're just really like giving them ammunition to do that by the way the uh cooper clip is in your dms okay um my okay i got twitter it. dms yep let me see. Uh, I will but yeah, I mean, this, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's wild um, to, to see that. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to say it again. We don't really do too much like electoral coverage and sort of breaking down why they're nuts. Um, the Democratic Party and like all of their advisors and, and, and campaign um, managers, et cetera. Um, 
but I'll just tell people, and I know most of our audience is probably aware of this. People like do not care about Trump the way that upper middle class, right. um, super plugged in liberals do. I know it might break some of y'all's heart to hear that. People do not care that much about Donald Trump in the way that you think that they do. Most people have moved on with their lives. They're concerned about you know series like bread and butter issues and material issues um, surrounding them. The fact that people still think that everybody is sort of suffering um, from you know this this continued freak out about Donald Trump. You know, um, nearly a year after I mean a, a year after he's lost the uh, after he lost the 2020 elections is delusional. And the fact that it seems that these the one the punnet class and certainly the kind of consultant class has not learned that lesson uh, i think is, is very very um worrying for their 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 chances in 2022 yeah i mean it's also such shows such incredible week because like i don't think trump would win in 2024 i think mm -hmm. if i think he's i think he might run but like i mean the only reason i say I think is that against kamala or pete Buttigieg. um <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't know, but did you um, see the? T sorry, there was a Harris poll that came out today, and and Her um, uh, Kamala Harris is um, tied with Mike fucking Pompeo. Mike Pompeo, she's tied tied with him. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about a depressing? Yeah. Anyways, I mean, I don't think it can be here. I'm almost like, I mean, that's a, that, that, that one of the good things Joe Biden has done is make her responsible for border issues, so it basically toxifies her for yes. the general election. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I mean, so we have this Anderson clip here because yeah. as everybody know, it did not take very long. So again, the Democrats run on this kind of stupid, we're not Trump message, which is only attractive to people who like, <laughs> um, people who work at CNN and at MSNBC, frankly, um, it did not take long for them to turn the narrative into the fact that actually it's not our insane campaign strategy it's not the fact that we're completely out of touch with people it's not the fact that we can't beat simple and stupid crt messaging from the right wing it's the progressives how much of this is a message just the democratic party that it's too far left I, I, I mean that that if you're the squad or if you're you know someone who's been calling for for defund police um or socialism or democratic socialism. I wonder, but I wonder, I wonder if, if, T, if Thierry had been able to stick on a message of economic progress, uh, you know, family uh, uh, leave and minimum wage and that kind of stuff. And uh, maybe we wouldn't be making this argument. In other, in other words, in other words, <laughs> uh, th there was an economic message uh, from the Democrats that was available and was necessary given the rising costs. But what happened is, uh, we 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 pulled out of our own federal uh, bill all the family leave stuff. You're, you're undermining the economic message for Terry McAuliffe and leave him with Trump is bad and, and vaccine mandates are good. Uh, I just I, 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 I don't know that it's an and, up and or down he, vote on on, and, progr on on progressive politics. It's and he up. leaned in to the school issue. I was stunned when he handed Yunkin the issue of the campaign. I don't think parents should be involved in the schools. And then literally on the eve of the election. He's running around Virginia with Randy Weingarten, the head of the union that kept the schools closed. It's not just the curriculum issue. The schools were closed. Parents were pissed. They knew they should have been open. And McAuliffe not only handed it to Yunkin on a tee, he then at the end of the campaign flipped everyone off and said, I'm going to even run on it even harder. And it has killed him in these suburbs. That, that is an important point that the McConnell guy says, that it isn't just the curriculum issue. It's that the curriculum issue was able to um, join in with this other issue about frustration with getting back to normal, which, by the way, is what Joe Biden ran on, right? Like the, the videos of empty or, or, or full stadiums again. And that was good that he did that, um, by the way, right? But the, the, the McCall just abandoned all of that. And like, like I said, like, again, the CT stuff's totally bullshit. You got to say something better than yeah, parents can't be involved in their teachers or their, their kids' education, right? You might be muted. Muted, David. I think that you're right, and it's 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 a hundred percent true. Um, that too. That I think that people do need to be really careful um, of. I don't know overplaying uh, COVID nineteen pandemic um, policies as like the things that they're, they're running on. Because again, that is also something that is extremely popular with a very specific class of liberals, but a lot of regular people are sort of hoping that we start to get closer to solutions. And the fact is, is that Biden has done a very bad job at managing the pandemic. 
Um, you know, we could talk about all the things that Trump did for sure. Um, but under Biden's administration, we had a very slow rollout of the vaccines. Uh, we've seen another massive wave. Um, I don't know, like, and, and, and lack of, of emergency um, provisions. Like we saw it early on when we were dealing with the pandemic, right? We've seen like almost like a lousy fair policy in a lot of ways um, from the Biden administration regarding this, except for the harshest and most unpopular aspects of dealing with the pandemic, right? Which are mandates, et cetera. Um, right. I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just... If you're tr if if the Democratic Party thinks that the way that they're going to <laughs> to maintain power is sort of running on um, finger uh, wagon PMC kind of cultural politics um, and not being Trump, whew, man, we are in for a very very rough next couple of years. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and a lot of those people can't learn those lessons. A no. lot of these Democrats came up at a time where that is fucking alien it's like x files <laughs> to them right like and they're gonna lose and that's yeah. the thing like mcauliffe like you don't have to tell me that the stat the generic democrat is probably on bounce and generic republican like the the people he uh signed um uh, i'm blanking on the term now for uh, prisoners or like expunge their sentences and like that sort of stuff that matters right i'm not gonna say that doesn't matter at the same time like Time comes for everybody and mm -hmm. like you can't get super upset about uh, especially <laughs> carlisle group governors i think yeah man and like again like i would like to have some of our comrades on from virginia to talk about this but boy i mean i was in that you know i lived in dc for a while and man there is a stink that comes and this is not saying that Yunkin is not a part of that world either right he's just as much a part of it um but i feel like the the kind of inability of of the democratic party in that state to be able to sort of break away from the kind like there's parts of of that like kind of washington dc side of of, of virginia right um the, the metro area that it's just like it's like deloitte it's like if deloitte were like a colony in like your, <laughs> your you know community right it's very frightening and it's a very specific group of people there um and they're all over the country don't get me wrong um but man you got to move away from trying to hope that you're know, sort of looking to that to be like the great light of progressivism and, and, and progress if yeah, you want I, a better future, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. Um, well, y'all, this has been a, another fun episode. We got to a lot today and I, um, I, I really enjoyed that, that interview talking about the way that uh, <laughs> our relationship to policing and incarceration in this country. I think that that's something that unfortunately we're probably going to have to be doing a lot more on in the future, but it's really important to get it put in those kind of clear terms that Alec was able to do. Um, very happy too that we were able to celebrate a couple wins, even though we have to sort of wrestle with our defeats. Uh, we yeah. have some fun stuff coming up um, in the post game. We have a little bit more Elon Musk. Uh, we have everyone's sweet and favorite boy, Thomas Friedman, um, has another thought experiment uh, for y'all. I don't think Matt has uh, read through this one yet, so I'm excited to share um, to invite Matt into the Mind Palace uh, that yeah. is Thomas Friedman's brain. And we got a couple more things, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, we'll get back to you on uh, what exactly we got. We'll do your questions and IMs. Um, and uh, I don't have my sheet. Uh, no, yeah, no worries. I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Um, so come by and join us in the post game, uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning. And we'll see you all in probably what, 25 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah, I'd say 25. Peace all out, right, folks. See you all soon.